Okay. The uh, follow thingy was not quite working before, so I fixed it. And uh, yeah, I came back to do another review. Um, I was surprised. I just um, threw up uh, the Clerks 3 review, and uh, that was a week ago tonight. And it's gotten 800 views, uh, which I think is the most I've ever gotten on anything. So I decided to go uh, for round two, and I went to Barbarian, which is a movie I've wanted to see for a very long time. Um, if you can't tell from the hat, then... Uh, sorry, bub, you missed the boat. But uh, anybody who does understand the hat, you know. You know. Um, but uh, yeah, there it is. I went to see... Barbarian today, one o'clock show, empty theater, my favorite kind of thing. Um, there was one other person in the theater who came in like right before the movie started and I was like, oh, because he sat behind me the whole time and it's like a really weird movie to have just one other person in the theater for. Um, but uh, I'm not here to talk about my theatrical experiences or how terrible they've been in the last year. I'm here to talk about a movie. So... Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about Barbarian a little bit. It was something I didn't expect. Um, first of all, I, I mean, I've been watching a lot of the uh, Twitch streams for The Whitest Kids You Know since the pandemic started. So I've heard a lot of stories from Zach Kreger and was hearing from him up to the movie, uh, him and uh, mostly with Trevor talking about the script and stuff like that. And then he left for the summer to go and film it last summer and came back and talked about it some more on all the streams. So I, I knew a lot about the movie. Not a big horror fan, but I said, uh, you know, I obviously I want to go to see it. One, for the fact that Zach made a movie. Uh, and two, it just, it looked good. Um, it's a really good premise. It, I think it's unique for a horror movie today. Um, it's something that it seems so obvious. Like, how did nobody else make this movie already? But I'm glad that he did. It's it's great. Um, so I'm going to get into it. I'm going to try to do the same thing I did last time. I'm going to stick to the, the sort of stuff that you can tell from the trailers first, and then I'm going to go into spoilers after that. But, um, so, uh, once again, I'm going to get my computer queued up with the Wikipedia page, just so I have um, a little bit of reference to some of the actors, because, like I said, I'm not... I'm not a huge horror person, but, um, one of the guys in the movie is a, like, a heavyweight horror actor, and I, I just don't want to get his name wrong. So, um, okay, here we are. Uh, Barbarian is a movie about a woman who goes to Detroit for a job interview and, um, stays in an Airbnb that she finds out is actually already occupied by somebody who booked it on Home Away. So she gets there, and then it's this sort of, like, awkward, you know, like, uh, what do we do? There are no rooms available. There's a big conference in town. So, like, they just decide, you know, uh, the the guy who's staying in the house is uh, Bill Skarsgård, and the, the woman who shows up is uh, Georgina, uh, sorry, Georgina Campbell. And um, Bill Skarsgård's character says to her, like, oh, it's fine, just you, just stay here. I mean, it's better than staying out there. This neighborhood is fucking crazy. So just, you know, stay here for the night. We'll figure this all out tomorrow. We'll call them and get our money back. Free stay. She's like, okay. So that's the premise of the movie. I mean, from the trailer, you can get all of that. Obviously, the house is not what it seems. So um, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil too much. Um, but. Uh, obviously, downstairs in the house, there's somebody waiting for them. And the way that it all plays out is really unexpected. Um, there are a lot of moments where you sort of think the story is going one way or it's it's going the other way, and it, it really unfolds in a much more natural way than it would if this was the real situation. So um, one of the things I really love is this this feeling of subversion through the entire movie that works. Um, they're taking, for example, like your expectation of the first guy that she sees. Well, he, you know, he seems very off and, and creepy and sinister. And the way that everything unfolds 
it, I think it, it's all about playing with expectations in the best possible way. So the shots in the movie, um, cinematography and the camera work are unbelievable. Some of the stuff that they were able to do, um, I happen to know they filmed a lot of the movie in Bulgaria and that enabled them to do a lot in terms of set construction, in terms of what they were able to do with the space. Um, Bulgaria is much cheaper to film in than Hollywood, than New York, Atlanta, any of those places. So they were able to do a lot of really cool stuff that I, I don't know if they would have been able to do on the same budget here in the U.S. There was also stuff that was filmed in Detroit. Um, I believe there was some stuff filmed in L.A. Um, I may be wrong about that, but I don't think so. And, um... Yeah, I, if you want to hear about the making of, uh, I understand that Zach was on a podcast uh, this week. Um, do not remember what it was called, but I'll put a link to it down below so that you can catch up if you're a big fan of the movie. Um, there's one shot of a guy driving in a car. Um, might be my favorite thing in the whole movie. Uh, it cuts to a shot of the same guy in another place, but that that initial shot is it's an over-the-shoulder shot. He's just driving. But just like how my hands are giant on this camera right here, it's the opposite way around. His hands are very small on the wheel, and he's this tall, sort of hulking guy. And it's just the weirdest, most off-putting. He's just driving a car, but the shot is so eerie, and he, like, waves to a neighbor and then, like, keeps going. And it's... I, I don't know why, but that visually, that shot was just so great. And there, it's not the only one. Um, there's a shot in the trailer, which I think you can see um, right off the bat, which is uh, Tess, which is Georgina Campbell's character, stepping over the threshold of the house. But as she does, it just fa it wipes a transition, like uh, wipes black across the screen as she's wa like she's walking into the house, and the house is just taking her over, and that was just really cool. Um, the makeup, unbelievable. I think that um, some of the subject matter, what they delve into is, I mean, it's like, it's really creepy stuff. Um, and it was, it was just solid. It, it was a really solid horror flick. So um, I'm going to start talking about spoilers after this, but I'd say just initial impressions. I'd say go see it. If you like horror films, if you don't like horror films, I, I think it was just a good, solid movie. There was a bit of humor in there. There were parts that I just thought were so funny and, and so well-crafted. And then there were parts that were just like, wow, Zach, like, holy shit. And um, that's what you want out of a movie. You want an emotional ride. You want to go somewhere, escape your life for a little while, sit down and just completely take something in for like two hours that's the perfect movie going experience and this is a perfect date night movie which is funny to say because it's so gross and everything but i think that horror is a great uh place to go out on a date um with i, I don't know if i said that correctly let me say it a little bit better horror is one of the best genres for dating because there's something about it that just lifts the energy of that encounter that, that evening together and um you know you find out about the person that you're with i went alone but you find out about the person that you're with by what scares them what makes them laugh in a horror movie i think that's more important sometimes and um yeah so i'm gonna go right into uh some of the spoilers i'm not gonna spoil the ending and i'm not gonna spoil the last i'd say the last 10 minutes of the movie i'm not gonna spoil any of that um because i think that that plays out really well but i will say um the two actors uh, that aren't completely, like, front and center right away are Justin Long and Richard Brake. And Richard Brake is the one I was talking about earlier, who he's uh, the kind of taller, hulking, sort of skinny guy with the hands on the wheel. Um, the story of the movie unfolds very much like I said at first. Tess and this other guy, Bill Skarsgård's character, Keith, are both staying in this Airbnb. So you expect that right away they're going to be toast. I mean, they're, they're going into this place and it's like, this is a weird situation. What you think as the viewer is that Keith is, is going to be the danger. Unless you've seen all the trailers and everything, which don't go 
crazy with trailers. Uh, I I think that it's good to get an idea of what a movie's going to be. I don't think it's good to sit and analyze and pick apart trailers for real movies. Uh, you can do that for the Marvel stuff. You can do that for um, anything in that pop culture comic book realm. Because you're looking for, oh, they're, they're doing... Because a trailer for those movies is an intentional... Hey, look here, we got Namor the Submariner. We got, you know, Ironheart busts right out of the, you know, the big piece of iron. So these are cues to the audience that will get you more engaged and involved. But with a, a movie like a horror movie, and I shouldn't have said real movie, that's not a fair thing to say. But with a horror movie, with a drama, anything that is a genuine attempt at like a film, a movie like Kid Detective, for example, like don't spoil Kid Detective for yourself. Just go see Kid Detective. It, it is great. I mean, like find it on VOD and watch it. It's a great movie. But those are movies you really don't want spoiled for yourself. And it's like the, the curse of watching Battlestar Galactica. At the beginning of Battlestar Galactica, there is this, the theme song, the, you know, them floating through space off to the, you know, explaining the, oh, the Cylons attacked and the, the colonies and they're out going for Earth. And then um, there's this like, boom, 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 And it's clip after clip after clip of the episode you are about to watch. And it's like, no, don't, like, don't show, don't show me everything. And it spoils shit. It spoils a lot of shit for the episode. So I rewatched Battlestar Galactica and it was like, oh my God, trailers for me are the same thing. I don't want to go out and see a thousand trailers before I see a movie. I want to see a poster for Marcel the Shell and be like, yeah, I'll, I'll watch Marcel the Shell. Which, um, I'm just going to throw a quickie in here right now. Marcel the Shell, 10 out of 10. Marcel the Shell with shoes on is a 10 out of 10. Awesome movie. And um, one of the only movies this year that made me cry. Like, really cry. Um... But anyways, back to Barbarian. So you have Keith and Tess. They're both staying in this Airbnb. And then it slowly sort of unfolds. It's awkward, but, like, she doesn't want to use the bed because they're dirty sheets, so he puts the sheets into the washer, and then she takes a shower, she gets out, and then he's he's saying, I noticed you didn't drink any of the tea that I made you, and I understand because, like, you don't know me, and I don't know you, and, you know, you could be distrustful of me. I, I would totally understand that, so... I have this bottle of wine, but I didn't want to open it until you were here because I wanted you to see that I was opening it and that it's not tainted or anything. I, you know, I don't want you to feel, like, weird or whatever. And slowly over the course of the night, they get friendly with each other and then they start drinking and then they start talking. They have similar interests. She's applying to be the researcher for a documentary film and the documentarian previously had done a, uh, like, jazz documentary. And he knows it. Like, he saw that documentary, and he's actually a part of the music community in um, Detroit. So she was talking to him, and he's like, well, maybe you should interview me. And then they're splitting the bottle of wine. They're having a good time. And then she goes to bed. And um, after she's in, in bed, he closes the door, goes over to the couch. And then the door just opens on its own. And she wakes up, and he, you can see, like, a beeline from her to him where he's on the couch, just just like freaking out, um, having like a nightmare. And so she gets up and goes over to him and is like, Keith, Keith, and like wakes him up and scares the shit out of him. And then um, she's basically like, uh, you know, I, I, I'm I sorry, my door was open. Did you open my door? He's like, no, you scared the shit out of me. Like, what the hell? So she goes back to bed and then wakes up the next morning She's a little bit late, so she runs out the door for her interview. And even just, like, the fact that she makes it to the interview is, to me, is nuts. Because, like, you just expect that this is a movie where... And it's a dark, rainy night when she shows up and everything. And you think that this is just like, oh, they're setting up, like, this is going to be the night everything happens or whatever. And it doesn't. It's just all suspense and buildup. I mean, who opened the door? But, you know... So then the next day, she comes back from the interview. Um, interview went well, and at the end, she tells the interviewee where she's staying, and she's like, you should, you should not be staying there. And um, then uh, basically uh, gets back to the apartment, uses the bathroom, realizes there's no toilet paper. So she goes like, ugh, goes downstairs, 
because the toilet paper is nowhere upstairs and it, it's in the basement on top of like the washing machine. But she gets locked down there. And then obviously she's like, ah, you know, like, what do I, my phone's upstairs, I have the key, so Keith can't even get in. And I'm, you know, stuck down here. So she starts investigating and she finds this pull rope that opens a secret door that leads to a tunnel which has um, another room at the end of it. And that room is just a dirty, soaked bed, a bucket, and a camera. And that's it. And a bloody handprint on the wall. And so she freaks the fuck out, goes upstairs, and Keith um, Keith helps her get back upstairs because Keith shows up at, at the house and she bangs on the window downstairs and he comes over and they pull it open, he gets the key, he comes in, and she's telling him, we gotta get the fuck out of here, we gotta get the fuck, like, now, we have to leave. And he's like, well, I'm not just gonna leave, like, I can't just leave, I don't have another place to go. So, um, he says, I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna take a look, and then, you know, we'll go. And, um, he goes downstairs and then he disappears. And she goes down after him and he's nowhere to be found, and it turns out, down the first hallway in this secret area, next to the room with the camera, is another door. And you can open that up. It's a secret door. It's like built in with like a, a two by four on the outside of it. So it doesn't look like a door that you can open that goes down into a like darker tunnel. So uh, Tess goes down after him and then hears him screaming from way down in the lower tunnel. And she's like terrified, but keeps on going down. And then sure enough, she finds him crawling on the floor and he says, somebody bit me down here. And then this naked old woman sneaks up on them, takes Keith's head and just fucking slams it into the, the side of the concrete and just annihilates the dude. And then it hard cuts and it's Justin Long driving by the beach in California. And he's just driving down Pacific Coast Highway, uh, blasting some song that he's singing along to. And then he gets a call and apparently he's an actor and they are no longer moving ahead on a pilot that he's in because he, he raped a woman. He sexually assaulted a woman. And so um, his life is kind of falling apart. But, like, we progressively kind of peel back the layers and see that he's just an asshole. Um, he goes back to Detroit where he owns the he owns the house. That's his part in the story. He is the owner of the house. He goes back to Detroit because he has a few properties in Michigan that he's trying to liquidate so that he can... Um, basically pay his lawyers and not go under because it's going to be about 140,000 to pay his lawyers for the the two suits that he has to do 70,000 for each case his um money manager guy just decides we're not going to handle your portfolio anymore we'll give you your files at the end of the week and he gets to Detroit and the first call that he gets is from like I think either his agent or his publicist and it's like you should not have left California like you're going to be charged with a crime you're going to look like a flight risk now. That was the worst thing you could have done. And he said, well, I'm not here to, you know, be a flight risk. I'm here because I, you know, have to liquidate. And so he shows up at the house. And then shortly after that, he gets captured by the woman and thrown into a cell where we find Tess. And this is about two weeks later because he's talking to the people on the, you know, property management company that runs the Airbnb stuff. And he says, somebody is here. Like, there's a car, there's stuff here. And they said, well, nobody's been there for two weeks. Like, you know, our last people checked out or whatever. So he's like, what the hell? And he ends up going downstairs. He finds the, the whole setup that um, Tess had, which was she puts a mirror underneath a light so that it'll shine into that dark hallway in the earlier part of the movie. And he finds that and he's like, what the hell? And then he realizes it's a door. So he finds the string and he opens it up. And that's how he ends up captured with her but the scene that they did to show him going into this place was like he finds this and then he goes upstairs and he looks up like okay like can i add this square footage to the listing and they're like well you can't really add it as living space because it's unfinished but it does go into the total square footage of the property and he was like awesome so he goes down with a tape measure and he's like trying to measure out all the space and he, he has no regard for the fact that he's in a room with like nothing but a bed and a fucking camera and a bucket doesn't care he's just measuring out the floor he moves the bed he sits on the bed at one point he goes like ugh, like you know one of the best scenes in the entire movie it, it completely cut through all the tension and everything and i knew it was going to ramp up right after that but it was like oh my god 
he goes further in and then the, the sort of story of what's going on here is really revealed where he passes by a room where there's this one tv with a vcr and it's playing a video of a mother breastfeeding and he's like oh gross it's basically a room with a bunch of blankets on the floor and um so he goes by that gets captured and then it turns out that this crazy woman just wants tess and him to be like her baby so she's trying to feed them with a bottle of like what must be her breast milk and it's just gross and covered in hair and shit and tess is like just do what she says and drinks from the bottle and, and stuff like that and he won't so he gets pulled by his hair and she brings him into the room with the video playing and starts like trying to breastfeed him and it's the most awkward uncomfortable just skeevy fucking like ugh. and then at one point it cuts to this random dude in the 80s or the 70s when like the economy was just on the downturn and um this is Richard Brake and we see that shot that I told you about with the the hands on the steering wheel it's literally the opposite of this it's it's this but from behind me so I I don't think that I'll do it justice here but it's basically uh, I don't know it's like this and he's just driving and he like slowly waves to his neighbor and stuff and um, I just, I loved everything about it. I, I thought that um, that whole section of the movie was so spellbinding because it takes the neighborhood that we've seen in Detroit, which is destroyed. And this is one of the advantages, I think, to filming in Bulgaria. They were able to reconstruct the entire set as like a 1970s or 80s version of it. And it's pristine. I mean, it, it looks like rows of the prettiest houses you ever saw in your life. Uh, to quote, what's it called? It's a Wonderful Life. Um, and it's just, like, it's a great statement on what happened to Detroit. It's a great statement on this kind of evil inside of people. Um, because you have the Justin Long character, and then you have Richard Brake. And at one point, Justin Long, um, when he gets taken uh, by the woman out of the cage to be breastfed, Tess escapes. And then... He ends up getting out from under the woman because she's going after Tess, and he finds Richard Brake still alive, like clinging to life at his bed in this further down part of the cave, and just watching some crap on TV, or, or maybe not, um, and playing some music, but he's like basically on death's door. And there are videotapes everywhere, so Justin Long takes a videotape and you know, just pushes it into the VCR, and um, it says something like gas station redhead on it, and it's clearly like Justin Long is watching one of the videos that this fucker made, which we don't see, but it's bad enough that Justin Long says, what the fuck is wrong with you? And then the guy takes out a gun and just blows his brains out. So now Justin Long has a gun, and he goes out trying to get out of this place. Tess is trying to go back in to save him, and it just goes completely tits up. And I'm not going to say anything more from there about the, the story itself. Um, I know that I have spoiled a lot, but I assure you it is 100% worth your time to go and sit through this movie. I, I'd say it was a solid 9.5 or 10 out of 10 um, for me. I, I mean, I'm also biased. I mean, I you know, I have the hat. Um which, again, if you don't understand, um, you know, I, 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 I can't explain it. I can't explain it for you, you know. You, just got, you weren't there. I, I was there. You weren't there. I don't know. But, um, yeah, um, GFY. And um, I think that visually the movie's great. I think that it touches on so many different points of fear, and it's... I, I mean, some of the gore is just, uh, like, perfect. Just perfect. And there are moments in this movie that I laughed really, really hard. Um, there are two cameos from Zach. One as a uh, agent, or <laughs> as an agent for um, Justin Long. One of the people on the phone call telling him, you know, this woman is going after you for sexual assault. And then the other time you see Zach is him talking to Justin Long in a Detroit bar, saying, hey, what really happened, man? What really happened? Where you kind of get the reveal that Justin Long 
actually, yeah, he, he totally sexually assaulted this woman who is accusing him of such and is costing him his career. But, like, we see shades of the movie trying to almost put out, like, oh, you know, should people be redeemed? And it snaps back so fucking hard at the end, and it is so... It, it was so satisfying to watch because it was a statement about Hollywood that didn't feel like a big liberal statement. You know what I mean? And I'm not a, I'm not a conservative. I'm definitely liberal. But there are times where you're watching content and you're just like, okay, I, you know, I, this is the social issue of the time and we got to talk about it or whatever. And that's, you know, that's fine. But um, that's all I got to say about the movie. I'm, I'm not trying to do an hour long review here. I just think um, it's worth your time. It's definitely worth going to see and uh, you should do that. So anyways, um, thank you to the 800, I'm looking at it right now, 886 people who watched my Clerks 3 review. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm probably going to keep on doing these because I got nothing else to do. Um, and it's fun. I like I like talking about movies. So um, maybe I'll grab a couple off of the Blu-ray shelf, do a couple of classics. Um, I don't think there's any need to do something like Everything Everywhere all at once because that's just an amazing movie. I, like, you should, you should go see that one too. That's an A24 film. Um, and I saw, that was the last film I saw in the theater, uh, earlier this year, and it's, I mean, just a, a great film, but everything that I could say about it has already been said. Um, so I'm trying to strike while the iron is hot, maybe, uh, go to Thursday night showings and try to get a review out on the Fridays and stuff like that, but, um, yeah, for now I'm signing off, but, uh, thank you again, and, uh, I guess I'll see you next time. Maybe.